to Washington Hebrew Congregation's Amram Scholar Series and our third annual Leslie Maitland Lecture. Um, if we don't know each other yet, I'm Rabbi Eliana Fischel, and I am so excited to uh, be able to be here with you this morning. Usually Rabbi Shankman gets this gig, uh, and I am so honored to be able to be here with you today. Um, whether you join us today in the small chapel, which is where you are right now, or on the live stream, um, we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Catherine Olmsted, followed by a discussion moderated by Leslie Maitland. For those who would like to purchase Dr. Olmsted's book, it will be available for signing following our program. Before we begin this morning's lecture, a little bit of background about this uh, Amram Scholar Series. The Amram Scholar Series offers a stimulating program of free lectures throughout the year in which world-renowned speakers, authors, scholars, political leaders, policy analysts, journalists, and theologians share their perspectives on timely issues or their research into history or, like today, a little mix of both. The program traces its beginnings to the fall of 1954 when the congregation moved into its Macomb Street home. That fall, participating in a nationwide celebration that marked the 300th anniversary of Jewish settlement in the United States, the temple launched what would become this widely recognized Sunday morning lecture program. The Amram series, as we know it, was founded a decade later in 1963 with an endowment from the estate of Adolf Amram and donations from temple families. In 1998, Rabbi Joseph Weinberg of Blessed Memory learned of Leslie Maitland's educational and professional background as both an alumna of the Harvard Divinity School and a former reporter for the New York Times and enlisted her help in running the Amram Scholar Series. For the past 25 years, we have been grateful for the imprint she has made on this vital program. Leslie poured her heart and soul into her dedicated mission of sustaining this exceptional lecture series and ensuring that its focus would remain nonfiction with all speakers recognized as respected authorities on their varied subjects. She tirelessly organized, planned, arranged, coordinated, publicized, and moderated hundreds of topical lectures, speakers, and events. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Leslie herself has been one of our Amram scholars, speaking on her own nonfiction book, Crossing the Borders of Time, A True Story of War, Exile, and Love Reclaimed. In addition, she has just returned from Germany, where she was invited to speak on Holocaust Remembrance Day in her grandparents' hometown of Freiburg. If that was not moving enough, she was accompanied by her daughter, Ariel, for whom she was, this was her first visit. We are grateful for Leslie's ongoing commitment and are delighted to be able to present a lecture in her honor each year. As I said earlier, Dr. Olmsted's presentation will be followed by an opportunity for discussion and Q&A, and we are thrilled that Leslie will be acting as our moderator. We are also extremely grateful to Eugene Goldman and Mark Shineson for connecting us with this morning's author and presenter, Dr. Catherine Olmsted, and for co-sponsoring this program. Um, I invite Mark up to the BIMA to formally introduce Dr. Olmsted. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out for what should be a very interesting lecture. Um, Dr. Catherine Olmsted is a professor of history at uh, UC uh, Davis uh, near Sacramento. She has a PhD from U UC Davis and uh, her BA in history with honors and distinction from Stanford University. Um, Dr. Olmsted studies the cultural and political history of the United States since World War I. Her first book, Challenging the Secret Government, examined the congressional and journalistic investigations of the CIA and FBI after Watergate, while her second book, Red Spy Queen, analyzed the origins and significance of the spy scare of the 1940s. Her third book, um, uh, what was entitled Real Enemies, explored the dynamic relationship between real government conspiracies and anti-government conspiracy theories. Um, her most recent book, which we're here to hear about, is called The Newspaper Axis, Six Press Barons Who Enabled Hitler. Looks at the isolationist media in the United States and the UK in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, Professor Olmsted also co-edited a book on the history of the Central Intelligence Agency and has published journal articles and book chapters that highlight her overlapping areas of expertise, conspiracy theories, government secrecy, espionage, counterintelligence, and anti-communism. Um, we're honored that you traveled all this way to talk to our congregation and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. <laughs> 
All right, well, thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, Marvin, also thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Um, I uh, am very honored to be here. So I am going to talk today about my most recent book, the, the newspaper Axis, and making sure this works. So that's the cover of it. Uh, the subtitle is uh, Six Press Barons Who Enabled Hitler. And I'm going to approach this. I'm supposed to talk for about 35 to 45 minutes. I have some visuals here. And I'm going to, uh, first of all, talk about how I got interested in this subject. And then I want to introduce you to these six press barons in turn. And then I want to talk about, um, walk you through what it would have been like to have been reading these newspapers in the 1930s, what you would have learned about the crisis in Europe. And then finally, I want to end up by talking about the political significance of this, mm -hmm. the topic, um, not only for understanding the World War II era, but for understanding our own current political moment and, and media environment. Okay. All right. So how did I get interested in the media of the 1930s? Right, so I got this, the idea for this book when I was researching my uh, book before this. It was called Right Out of California, and it was about um, the businessmen in California who organized against Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal in the 1930s. So as part of my research for that, I read a lot of newspapers that were owned by William Randolph Hearst, and he was a figure in the book. And I got more and more interested in Hearst. Um, so you might all have heard of Hearst. He was uh, the most important media figure of his age, arguably the most important media baron in US history. Uh, he owned at his peak 28 newspapers in some of the biggest cities in the United States. He owned mass circulation magazines, he owned radio stations, he owned a wire service, a newsreel company, a feature film company. So he had many different ways to reach the American people. Right? And he was not shy about using his media outlets to spread his political views, not just on the editorial pages, but throughout his newspapers and, and magazines and in his newsreels. And so what intrigued me about Hearst was that he was so powerful and he was so opposed to Franklin Roosevelt. He just despised Roosevelt's New Deal, uh, particularly because of the, the labor rights. And he worked tirelessly to make sure that Roosevelt's uh, political career was ruined. Yet he was not successful, obviously. Roosevelt was reelected three times. And so um, then I started to get more interested in the ways that he was successful in spreading his political views. So he was not successful in attaining his domestic political goals in killing the New Deal, but he was successful for a time in spreading his views about foreign policy, particularly the crisis in Europe in the 1930s and the rise of fascism. So what he wanted to do in the 1930s was to prevent the US government, led by President Roosevelt, from taking any action to oppose Hitler's actions on the continent of Europe, to take any actions to confront or challenge Nazism. This was throughout the 1930s, and then once the war began in Europe in 1939, um, Hearst tried to shape public opinion so that the United States would not aid Great Britain against the Nazis. And he did everything he could to make sure that the United States did not intervene in the war. Right? He led, for example, a massive campaign against the Lend-Lease Bill to send aid to Great Britain, which he called the Dictator Bill, because he said it would make Roosevelt a dictator. So he lost that battle and he you know, lost the battle against intervention. But for many years, he was successful in creating this media environment that made it very difficult for President Roosevelt or any internationalists in the US government to take stands to confront the Nazis. So my question became, how was that possible? How was he so successful? 
And I concluded that it was because he was not alone. Uh, the most powerful press barons in the United States and the UK used their media power to promote what was called isolationism in the US and appeasement in the UK. These were not the elite newspapers, that, but the newspapers that had the biggest circulations, the uh, newspapers that most ordinary people read. And what these newspapers said over and over again was that this, there was no fascist threat that should concern the US or the UK. Um, they urged appeasement of fascist or dismissal of fascist. And in some cases, they actually published pro-fascist propaganda. And their views, which were very xenophobic, nationalist, isolationist, and sometimes anti-Semitic, um, made it harder for the anti-fascists in their governments in the US and the UK to challenge the Nazis earlier. So the press lord's insistence that their governments should not confront the fascist dictators made a war against fascism both more likely and more difficult to win. All right, so now it's important to note at the outset that these media moguls did not oppose all military interventions. It wasn't that they were just pacifists who said, no, we should never go to war. Uh, for example, the American press barons cheered on and sometimes even demanded US interventions of Latin America. And uh, the British press barons were m big supporters of the British Empire. So rather than opposing military intervention in general, they opposed military opposition against the Nazis specifically. And so these six press barons that I, that I look at in my book, there's two Britons and four Americans, reached tens of millions of readers in the 1930s. And so I have called their alliance the newspaper axis. This is not a term I came up with. It was coined by one of President Roosevelt's advisors, Harold Dickies. Uh, but I decided to make it the title of the book because I think it captures the transnational cooperation of these uh, press barons. So what I do in the book is to explore the ways that they use their newspaper empires uh, in support of authoritarian and even fascist policies, how they worked with one another, and how they shaped and limited the options of policymakers. And the book argues that fake news, bias, anti-democratic sentiment in the media are hardly unique to our time. Okay, so that's an overview of where the book is going. Now let me um, introduce each of these six press, press parents to you, tell you a little bit about uh, where they came from and why they were so popular, and then I'll talk specifically about the coverage. All right. So starting uh, with the most extreme of the press barons that I looked at, this is uh, Lord Harold Rothermere. He was the owner of the Daily Mail. The Rothermere family still owns the Daily Mail. The, the London Daily Mail was in the early 1930s the most popular newspaper in the English speaking world, so sold the most copies. And Lord Rothermere, uh, pictured here with Adolf Hitler, uh, was, overtly sympathetic to Hitler. And throughout the 1930s, he personally reported stories about how Hitler was making Germany great again, reviving the country, um, giving everyone a new uh, enthusiasm. And this positive coverage went uh, on up to 1939, right? So he is the one of the six that was over overtly pro-fascist throughout the 1930s. All right, the other uh, British press baron that I look at, a very different figure, um, but who tried to shape policy in the same way. This is Lord Max Beaverbrook. And Lord Beaverbrook uh, was a Canadian, born in Canada, moved to the UK about 1910. He was about 30. He had a fortune that he had made in Canada. And he invested that fortune in newspapers and soon owned uh, three very important British newspapers, the most important being, being the London Daily Express. 
and the Daily Express overtook the Daily Mail by the mid-1930s to be the most, the best-selling newspaper in the English-speaking world. So um, Beaver Brook's a little more complicated than Rothermere because he was never a fan of Hitler. He didn't, uh, you know, dine with Hitler and have his picture taken with him or write fawning editorials about him. And later, during World War II, Beaver Brook actually um, took a dramatic turn, went to work for Churchill's government, and uh, was the uh, minister for aircraft production, and helped Britain win the war. Right. So uh, most British people now remember him as a hero of World War II. But in the 1930s, he was very pro-appeasement, where he also used the word isolationist. He believed that it was disastrous for Britain to have any involvement with what Hitler was doing on the continent, first with oppressing Jews and then with invading his neighbors. He said over and over again, this has nothing to do with us. All right, then turning to the Americans, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was Hearst uh, and his vast uh, media empire. So Hearst um, was a Californian, born in San Francisco, got into newspapers in the um, 1880s with the San Francisco Examiner, then moved to New York in the 1890s, and got a reputation for taking his vast fortune and using it to uh, improve his newspaper's technology. So. You could get color comics in the Hearst Press and better headlines and better art, and the presses were faster. So he would use his money to make it a better technical product, and then he paid a lot of money to have the best writers. But mostly what Hearst was famous for, the way he made his fortune and expanded his empire, was to have a very sensationalist coverage of events, known as yellow journalism at the time. So what he liked to do was to make his newspapers very fun to read. So for example, here are the rules that he used. Um, as here he is, this is from a letter I found that he wrote to one of his editors. This is the way he wanted his newspapers to look. He wanted people to look at the first page and say, oh gosh, and at the second page and say, gee whiz, and at the third page and say, holy Moses. Right? So this was the formula that he used to reach 30 million American readers a week by the 1930s. Okay. All right, and then the other three Americans that I look at were actually cousins. They were three grandchildren of Joseph Medill. And Joseph Medill had been an anti-slavery activist, founder of the Republican Party, early supporter of Abraham Lincoln, mayor of Chicago, and one of the first owners of the Chicago Tribune. And after he died, eventually his newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, uh, was run by two of his grandsons, pictured there, Robert McCormick and Joe Patterson. And they fell out, had disputes. Joe Patterson then moved to New York to start his own newspaper, and Robert McCormick ran the Chicago Tribune. The Chicago Tribune by the 1930s was the best-selling regular-sized newspaper in the United States. So the best non-tabloid newspaper, the best-selling non-tabloid newspaper. McCormick was very, very conservative in every single aspect of his life and his politics. Um, many people called him reactionary. So uh, one of his critics said that he had the greatest mind of the 14th century. <laughs> So McCormick, like Hearst, was not afraid to use his, um, to tell his editors and reporters that he wanted the news to reflect his political views. This was an era when journalism in general was adopting the idea that the media should not be biased, but Hearst and McCormick didn't care, right? And so McCormick would write many memos to his reporters telling them how to cover the news. And the way he wanted it covered was, first of all, very anti-New Deal, anti-Democratic Party, anti-Roosevelt domestically, and very, very isolationist in his foreign policy views. Right. Strongly believed that the United States should not have anything to do with, um, with Europe. And McCormick not only had 
this best-selling regular-sized newspaper in the United States, but also he owned uh, a radio station, WGN Radio. WGN um, came from the Tribune slogan, which was world's greatest newspaper. <laughs> and it, was a, it had a massive uh, um, signal, 50,000 watts, that could be heard over many states. And McCormick not only used the Tribune as his an outlet for his political views, but he had a show, a weekly show on WGN where he would talk about the nation's politics. Uh, all right, McCormick's cousin Joe Patterson initially started running the Tribune with him. They had disputes. Patterson then moved to New York and started America's first tabloid newspaper, the New York Daily News. This is in 1919. And uh, he, like Hearst, hit upon a, a, a formula for success. This was a lot of comics, a lot of sports, and a lot of sensational news. So here is one of his uh, writers talking about what they tried to do in the Daily News. The, the things people were most interested in were in order lover, sex, money, and murder, especially if you could comp combine all three of those in one story. Right? And so the Daily News quickly started getting massive circulation. By the 1930s, it was the best-selling newspaper in America. By World War II, it was selling up to four million copies a day on Sundays, which made it the best-selling newspaper in US history, then or since. So uh, an example of how Patterson used the sensationalism to um, get readers came in 1928, one of the most infamous daily news stories ever. There was this woman named Ruth Snyder who conspired with her lover to kill her husband, and she was convicted and sentenced to death. This was exactly the sort of story that the Daily News loved. Right? They covered the trial extensively. Um, and when she was going to be executed by the state, um, they wanted a picture of her in the electric chair. And the state of New York said, no, you can't do that, but you can watch. So the Daily News photographer went into the execution viewing chamber with a camera strapped to his ankle and pant his pants leg covering up the camera, but there were two ropes underneath his pants leg. One was connected to the shutter and the other to the hem of his pants. And the moment that she was executed, he pulled up his pants leg and pulled the shutter and got a picture of her um, being killed um, by the state. And this was, they sold hundreds of thousands of extra copies that day. Right. All right, so Joe Patterson had this phenomenally newspa popular newspaper by the 1930s. His sister and Robert McCormick's cousin, Sissy Patterson, did not initially um, go into the family career of journalism because she was a girl and it just wasn't considered something that women would do in those days. So she was a socialite um, uh, debutante. She had a, 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 a mansion here on DuPont Circle where apparently she gave the best parties. Um, but then right around 1930, she was approaching age 50 and she decided, you know what, I'm, I want to be a journalist like my brother and cousin. So she asked her friend, William Randolph Hearst, can I buy one of your newspapers? He said, no, but you can run uh, the Washington Herald for me. And so she started out working for Hearst as his, the editor of the Washington Herald. And uh, by 1937, she bought both the Herald and the Washington Times from him, combined them into the Washington Times Herald. And she became uh, the first woman publisher of a major metropolitan newspaper in the United States in the 20th century. And she made the Washington Times Herald into the best-selling newspaper in Washington, DC. And one of the most significant things that she did was that she arranged for her brother's stories, the New York Daily News um, news coverage of Europe, New York Daily News editorials and cartoons to show up in the Washington Times Herald every morning. So it had a much bigger reach. Back then, if you had a New York newspaper, it was hard to reach Washington decision makers. But she ran them every day in the Washington Times Herald so that they could see the New York Daily News editorials. All right. Okay, these newspapers had uh, 
a very large reach. I think, oh, I guess the, the, okay, they all did transfer. This is a graph. On the left is hearse daily and Sunday circulation. Uh, next to that is hearse patterson mccormick daily and Sunday circulation. And then con for comparison, there's the New York Times and the New York Herald Tribune. If you read the histories of these eras, of this era, historians many times will quote the New York Times and the New York Herald Tribune. These were internationalist newspapers that believed that the United States should have an opinion on what was happening in Europe. Right? But in fact, most people, ordinary people, were not reading the New York Times or the Herald Tribune. They were reading Hearst newspapers or the New York Daily News or the Chicago Tribune. They had a far bigger reach. And what they learned from those newspapers was very different from what they learned from the New York Times. All right, so if you did read these newspapers in the 1930s, what would you learn? All right, starting out with 1930, Hearst used his newspapers to spread first-person accounts, first-person stories written by Nazi leaders, including Adolf Hitler. So here is a story from 1930 that's written by Hitler about the situation in Germany that appeared in Hearst newspapers throughout the country. This is before Hitler uh, you know, gained power in Germany, but he was a major political figure. And uh, not just Hitler, but many uh, of Hitler's advisors were paid handsomely to write these stories for the Hearst Press. Now, this was not unusual. Hearst paid many world leaders to write for his newspapers, and he paid them very well. He had Mussolini as a columnist for many years. Um, but by paying the Nazis to write these stories, running them unedited as Nazi propaganda helped normalize them. So that you would see a story by David Lord, Lloyd George, former Prime Minister of Great Britain, and then a story by Adolf Hitler. It right? helped normalize them in the American mind. Um, Hearst also was very enthusiastic up until the mid-1930s about Hitler. So in 1934, Hearst went to Germany on one of his many art buying trips. Um, he went to the Nuremberg rally, the famous one where Lenny Riefenstahl made triumph of the will. And he met Hitler and uh, wrote uh, a story about meeting Hitler and gave interviews to other reporters. And this is, you know, among many of the positive things that he said that uh, Hitler had restored character and courage to Germany. It's extraordinary. We estimate him too lightly. He has an energy, enthusiasm, marvelous faculty for dramatic oratory, great organizing ability. Right? So what he was telling other reporters and the American audience is, we don't need to worry about this guy, and he's doing a great job in Germany. So this is 1934. Remember, um, Dachau, the first concentration camp, was set up in 1933 and many uh, laws that barred Jews from many professions had already been passed. Right. Now, uh, by 1935, Hearst started pulling back from that. He was no longer as enthusiastic about what was happening in Germany. But throughout the 1930s, he was emphatic that the United States should not do anything to intervene in what was happening in Germany, even after Hitler started invading his neighbors. All right, Rothermere, again, was the most extreme of these six that I looked at. Lord Rothermere, again, was the owner and publisher of the London Daily Mail. Rothermere, like Hearst, went to Germany, met with Hitler, socialized with Hitler uh, several different times, wrote him many personal letters that were very sy sycophantic, and he personally reported stories about how um, Hitler was improving Germany and taking it to a new level. This is in 1934. Um, also in 1934, Rothermere was um, very enthusiastic about the British uh, fascists. They were called black shirts. He wrote many stories and encouraged his reporters to write many stories about the British Union of Fascists and how they were uh, improving 
uh, how they should be put in power in, in Britain. Now he did pull back on that uh, in late 1934 because of opposition from advertisers. Uh, but he continued his pro-Hitler enthusiasm up until the war started. All right, so those two, Hearst and Rothermere, were overtly um, cheering on Hitler in the early years, at least. Uh, the, um, the McCormick Pattersons and Lord Beaverbrook were not, they did not write pro-Hitler propaganda for their newspapers, but once Hitler started invading his neighbors, they continually used their news coverage to emphasize how it was not important, was not a threat to the United States or the Great, or Great Britain. So this is a, an editorial from uh, the New York Daily News when the Germans reoccupied the Rhineland and um, remilitarized it in 1936 in opposition to the Versailles uh, Treaty. And uh, the conclusion of the Daily News editorial was, you know, what's it to us? He's just invading, uh, he's just occupying his own territory. He isn't occupying anyone else's. So we should not say anything, do anything against this because it might provoke him and then we could end up in a war with him, right? It was the same um, position that the Daily Express had. Here's a quote from a Daily Express editorial on the invasion of the Rhineland. The Germans have reoccupied the Rhineland. What does that mean to us in capital letters? Like, why should we care? We should not implement any sanctions or do anything that might provoke Hitler so that he would then turn on us. Now, the, um, throughout the mid-1930s, the Daily Express under Beaverbrook ran many stories that emphasized to its readers that Hitler was not a threat to Great Britain, that uh, he really, he kept the peace, he was reasonable, he was a rational guy, you could deal with him, he was only um, occupying his own territory and the British did not need to do anything in response. This is an infamous Daily Express story from August of 1939 that predicted that there would be no war this year because Hitler didn't want war, and then the war started two weeks later. <laughs> now, uh, what I found interesting in the archives was that um, the Daily Express in London under Beaverbrook and the Daily News in New York under Patterson had essentially the same line uh, over and over again Hitler's reasonable, Hitler has no aggressive intentions, and also even if he does, why should we care? And it turned out that they were collaborating quite a bit, um, Beaverbrook in London and Patterson in New York. They wrote many letters to each other, they vacationed together, and um, they tried to meet Hitler, but he wouldn't meet with them. Um, and Beaverbrook, then decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put together a flyer, a pamphlet that encapsulates how British and Americans who read the Daily Express and the Daily News don't want anything to do with Europe, don't want their governments to have anything to do with Europe. And so he put together this, this pamphlet called From Across the Atlantic that has the Statue of Liberty and a British lion and the inside the pamphlet were quotations from the Daily Express and the Daily News showing how the real people of Britain and America did not want their governments to take any stand against Hitler. And he paid, Beaverbrook paid to print 10 million copies of this pamphlet and then to distribute them to every household in Great Britain. All right, now, once the war started in Europe in 1939, you know, the British press barons obviously stopped writing stories about isolationism and about uh, uh, positive stories about fascism. But the American papers went into overdrive in the period from 1939 to 1941 to convince their readers that the U.S. government should not take any action to help the Allies, should do everything it could to stay out of World War II. So I just, I, I've identified a few themes here in this period from 1939 to 1941. How did they argue 
against interventionism. And by they, again, I mean the, the four press barons in America that I looked at, Hearst, the Pattersons, McCormick, and um, uh, Mc, Hearst, both Pattersons and McCormick. All right, so what were their arguments? Well, over and over again, they said, you know, President Roosevelt says we should send aid to the Allies, then later when it was just Britain, to Britain. Um, and you know why he wants to do that. It's not because he believes, really, that the U.S. is in danger, has any sort of national security interest. It's not because he believes the U.S. has any moral obligation to uh, help the people who are fighting Nazism. It's because he wants a war, because then he can suspend the Constitution and become a dictator. And you can see this most clearly in the fight over Lend-Lease, which was in the winter of 1941. Um, Hearst, in particular, launched an all-out campaign to make sure that Congress did not pass Lend-Lease, which was Roosevelt's proposal to aid Great Britain. And so Hearst, uh, the Hearst newspapers, as you can see here, sometimes referred to Lend-Lease, not as Lend-Lease or the British Aid Bill or the Armaments Bill, but instead as the Dictator Bill, without quotation marks. So if you're reading a Hearst newspaper, you're not hearing about lend -Lease, you're hearing about the dictator bill, because Roosevelt wants it because he wants to become a dictator. Um, the Chicago Tribune actually made Hearst seem like a moderate. Um, the Chicago Tribune always used the term dictatorship bill in referring to lend -Lease, in the news stories, in the editorials. And um, later on during the war, once the war started, these newspapers predicted that Roosevelt so wanted to be a dictator that he was going to uh, suspend elections. Right? That the whole reason he was asking for this aid, the whole, whole reason he wanted to get into the war was to have this opportunity to seize uh, real power and destroy the republic. All right. Um, they also these are over and over, they argued that the British were just manipulating the Americans, trying to get Americans to fight their war. And you had to be on um, guard against that. So here are some examples of editorial cartoons in the New York Daily News from 1941 that make this argument. Um, on the right there, you have Uncle Sam, only in the cartoon he's labeled as Uncle Sap. And he is being seduced by a woman who's, who's a ghoulish figure labeled uh, World War II, and she is, you know, drawing him into doing the wrong thing. Here's another one where they're cheering. Um, the dictatorship bill is what the martini glasses are, are labeled, um, and, uh, you know, toasting to joining the war, and uh, she has triumphed over him. All right. Another argument that the Daily News in particular used a lot was that um, the war was going to turn into a race war and white people were going to lose. Um, there was a lot of racialization in the Daily News editorials in particular. Jews were considered a, a separate race um, and there was a fear that Jews were bringing the white race to fight each other, Anglo-Saxons fighting Anglo-Saxons, and that then they would end up killing each other, and what the Daily News called the yellow race would end up ruling the world. Um, so here's an editorial from 1941 that makes that argument. Um, you'll notice the question at the question mark at the end, which is a, a common um, thing that conspiracy theorists do, is they say, I'm just asking questions. Is this war gonna end in the passing of the great race? Something to think about. Yeah. All right, and finally, of course, they, uh, they blamed the Jews for conspiring to draw the United States into war. Um, here's, it, it, it's very interesting the way they would make these arguments. So here's an example from a Daily News editorial um, that's labeled just anti-Semitism here, and it seems to say that, it's, it starts out by saying plenty of people hate the Jews, and then they say, but you know what? We think the Jews are fine. Uh, they have racial faults, but they're disappearing in the American melting pot. So it's not that we're the anti-Semites, it's that other people are. However, a theme of the Daily News editorials was over and over again, the Jews better watch out, because if they keep advocating for their racial kinfolk in Europe, then 
real Americans are going to turn against them, and they'll be in danger. So uh, here's another example of that. This is an editorial about there were American Nazis uh, in 1940 who were arrested by the FBI for planning a race war against Jews. And uh, the Daily News describes them as dreamy-eyed young men, says these people aren't a threat to the United States, the FBI is really overreaching, and then goes on to talk about, you know, if the Jews know what's good for them, they will not be advocating for war in Europe or else there could be more of these extremist uh, attacks against them. All right. Now, once the war began for the United States in December of 1941, after Pearl Harbor, I think most people in the United States think, well, that's when isolationism died. You know, everybody pulled together and fought the war after Pearl Harbor. And that, to a degree, that's true of, of Hearst. But Patterson and McCormick continued to use words like isolationist. Here's an editorial from 1944. Of course, we're for America first. And they use these terms throughout the war. I'm a proud isolationist. I'm a proud America firster. Even as they're saying we support the troops, they believe that the U.S. was really engaged in a misbegotten war. And it had to be won, we were in it, but that it was a mistake from the beginning. And over and over again, they emphasize that this was a Roosevelt plot. Uh, and when he ran for president uh, for the fourth time in 1944, it really pushed them uh, over the edge, and they said over and over again that this was proof of what they had been arguing, that really he just wanted to be a dictator, and that perhaps he would never give up power, that he would uh, make his son his, his heir. Right. This continued on into the post-war period, the very last day of the war when the Japanese actually signed uh, the peace treaty the New York, I'm sorry, the Chicago Tribune ran a story that it had been holding for several months, waiting for the end of the war. This story also ran in the Daily News and the Washington Times Herald. Um, Exposed more secrets of Pearl Harbor scandal. It argued that uh, the Pearl Harbor attack had actually not happened as Americans thought. The Roosevelt had uh, deliberately provoked the Japanese into attacking and then uh, deliberately not told the commanders at Pearl Harbor because he wanted an excuse to get into war against the Nazis. It was a very complicated plot, but it was set forth by these very popular newspapers, and it was a popular right-wing conspiracy theory uh, in the 1940s and 50s. Okay. All right. So what's the significance of all of this? Well, first of all, there's the significance for World War II. You have this era when it's a very dangerous moment in world history. Hitler's building up his military, invading his neighbors, and then starting a world war. And at this time, you have these very, these best-selling press barons trying to convince their governments that there is no fascist threat, that their government should not take any action. And uh, their divisive politics and sometimes hateful messages had enduring appeal. Uh, the Daily Express and the Daily Mail are still around. They're still very nationalist. They were both very pro-Brexit. In fact, the Daily Express uh, took credit for Brexit um, and uh, claimed that it was the newspaper that led the campaign. It's still a very isolationist and nationalist. In the United States, of course, the Hearst, Patterson, McCormick press either don't exist or they've been bought out or they're a shadow of their former selves, but that doesn't mean that the kind of journalism that they practiced has, has gone away. Um, and you could see this story that I've been telling about the American press lords as sort of the primordial story of Fox News. Right? This, is, this is the right-wing media, the nationalist message of the 1930s and 40s. So the last of the press lords died more than a half century ago, but their heirs continue the crusade for Britain first and America first. All right, thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Well, I was just in the middle of thanking Dr. Olmsted, and certainly also want to thank Rabbi Fischel for your very generous remarks. Thank you so much. I have to say that uh, your book,
really triggered a memory for me because many years ago, when I was starting out as a reporter for the New York Times, this was in 1979, I was assigned to cover a march that was a march for Soviet Jewry uh, that went from Temple Emanuel in Fifth Avenue in New York to the United Nations. Speaker after speaker got up of the, of the officials present, including Governor Carey, and said that it was the largest demonstration of any kind for any purpose in the history of the city of New York. So when I came back to the paper and started writing the story, I said, in the March today that it was described as the largest in the in history of New York, um, two and more than 200,000 people had marched for Soviet Jewry. As I was writing the story, an editor came running to, the, to my desk and he said, we would like you to take that quote out of the lead and move it far down into the story. And they kept moving it further and further down. And finally I said, why are you taking this salient fact of which anyone would think would be the lead of the story and pushing it to the bottom? And they said, because if we say that, we're going to have to run the story on the front page, and we don't want to put the story on the front page. Wow. I was so shocked. And uh, about uh, a week later, the editor who was the, in charge of the letters to the editor page came down from the eighth floor to the newsroom on the third floor, sought me out, and he said, I just had to come and tell you that in the history of all the years that I have handled uh, letters to the editor, I have never, ever received more mail uh, then I have received objections to this because the story with the lead uh, denuded like that ran on page 61. So I mention this just because your book triggered this memory and because it you know, does call to mind the question of whether you know, how even there back in 1979, attitudes of, of the press lords in, in regard to Jewishness whether they were anti-Semitic, or I think in the New York Times case where they were afraid of appearing too Jewish and wanted to uh, avoid that, that, uh, that branding, um, led them to downplay news of importance to Jews. So, um, so I wanted to ask you, it led to my first question here. Um, you have talked a lot about the, uh, how the opinions of the press lords and the owners of these, these great syndicates, uh, uh, how their opinions about the war and such affected their editorial stances and the uh, kinds of arguments that they were making to influence the American people. How did their opinions affect the news coverage in terms of what Hitler was doing to the Jews at that time? How did it affect the this on now? Okay. How did it affect the news coverage of what Hitler was doing to the Jews? Well, uh, in most cases, uh, they didn't cover it. You know, it just didn't show up in their newspapers. Um, certainly, the Daily Mail, when it covered those sorts of things, would indicate, well, you know, it's just, uh, the Jews deserve it, right? They've, they've done something to, um, to provoke this sort of, um, these rules, these laws. Um, and in fact, in one of the stories he wrote himself, he talked about um, people with uh, Israelite attachments who were um, ruining Germany, and so it just made sense that they had to be restrained in the kind of positions that they held. Um, the, certainly, there were reporters, individual reporters, on the Chicago Tribune and on the Daily Express, who especially as the, um, uh, the situation in Germany got more obviously violent. In other words, it wasn't just the laws that were passed, it wasn't just people disappearing to the camps, but it was, you know, Kristallnacht. There were individual reporters who tried to cover that and they did sometimes succeed in getting individual stories in the newspapers, but the editorial stance of their owners was clear because the edit the, their owners would write editorials saying, whatever's going on in Germany does not have anything to do with us. I wonder you know, how many of these newspapers have uh, come forward and reevaluated their coverage in, in more recent years. Um, 
I did take a look at the, how the New York Times, I know, has done some mea culpa uh, kind of reporting about it. And uh, when you uh, take a look, it, it is quite shocking that, for example, in the, in the six years of, uh, from 39 to 1945, they only mentioned Jews as being victims of, of Hitler six times. Yeah. And uh, on the front page. And most stories were just little tiny items buried in the back. And when they talked about the persecution of, of uh, Jews, they never mentioned them as being Jews. They mentioned victims of uh, uh, refugees or uh, persecuted minorities and actually avoided even using the word Jew uh, in any of the coverage. So the, the Times has acknowledged this more recently. Right. Has, have any of the other papers? Uh... No, they haven't, and that's a very interesting point. I'm sure that was partly motivated by the Daily News constantly editorializing. If Jews knew what was good for them, they wouldn't uh, advocate for their racial kinfolk in Europe, right? So the New York Times didn't want to appear to be, um, you know, as you said, too Jewish. Right. And so they, they downplayed it, even though they were known as an internationalist newspaper, right. um, an interventionist newspaper. They still tried to uh, minimize the implications of those stories, for sure. Um, and you know, it's interesting. I hadn't even thought about that issue of apologies. The Daily News, in, during World War II, its editorials were so strongly anti-Roosevelt um, and indicating that the United States shouldn't be in the war at all that uh, Nazi propaganda actually read them on the radio, read New York Daily News editorials on the radio. And American fascist publications, uh, you know, neo-Nazi newspapers, reprinted them. But to my knowledge, the Daily News has never apologized. A lot of the reason, I imagine, is that you know they were able to distance themselves by having those question marks. Um, you know, some people are saying, yeah. you know, that this uh, that the Jews are uh, drawing us into war, and they better be careful about that. So I imagine that years later they would say, well, why don't we have? Um, anything to apologize for. We just said that the Jews should be careful. Yeah. But even things like the final solution were not publicized. The, uh, the fact that millions of, of Jews were being uh, murdered you know, and taken away to camps, even though it was known by reporters, apparently, based over there at the time, it simply was not being reported. Right? And uh, it's shocking the, the degree to which this went on. And no wonder that. Uh, more was not done sooner when the uh, news outlets were really burying the, the stories that was happening. It's, it's totally incredible. Um, so uh, when you compare what was going on uh, in those days to today, you mentioned you know, Murdoch and right-wing media. What conditions in the world do you think make it so, um, uh, are there to make it Appealing to appeal to uh, 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 racist prejudice, um, anti-Semitism, uh, isolationism, uh, things like that. Well, that, you know, that's that's a very good question because it's interesting that there's so many different, so many differences between the media environment then versus today. Right um, at that point. 82% of Americans read a newspaper every day. So that's where they got their news. 57% of them said they got most of their um, foreign news from newspapers. Radio in the 1930s was really in its infancy, especially in the mid-30s, and it would just, the news reporters would read the newspaper stories on the air. There wasn't a lot of independent reporting until the, the war started in Europe in 39. So people were getting their news from what we now call legacy outlets. And of course, that's not true at all today. Yet, what's, I think, striking the similarity is that the themes, regardless of whether you're talking about a newspaper in the 1930s versus um, you know, a website or social media today, is that the people who can make money out of getting more clicks or selling more copies, 
realize that there's money to be made in outrage. And so uh, you can stoke people's fears and uh, by saying your country, you, your people are being manipulated, are being lied to. And so you should read us to get the truth. That is a really good point. Um, so let me open it up to questions here. Thank you both very much. All right. New York City had the largest Jewish population in the United States, and people knew, at least some of them, what was going on in Germany and in the conquered territories. What did they say? What did the major Jewish organizations say? And of course, the New York Times was owned by Jews, the Salzburgers, and they actually were very apprised of developments. So please speak to that. Well, uh, the Hearst newspapers and the New York Daily News in particular were hated by uh, many, if not most, leaders in the New York Jewish community. And so what they did was to organize boycotts. Is this on? Yeah, I'm just going to take, I'm going to steal your microphone, but all right. Okay. I'll give it back to you. Can she repeat what she just said? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right, so uh, there were boycotts organized against the Hearst newspapers uh, in the mid-30s, which actually hurt him quite a bit. Uh, and briefly, he went into bankruptcy. He was still one of the richest men in the world, but he, he was technically in bankruptcy and had to sell off some of his art and his homes. Um, so the, the boycott against the Hearst newspapers was somewhat effective. Um, the, uh, there was also a campaign against the New York Daily News, a Jewish-led campaign against the New York Daily News. And that was one of the most interesting documents that I read in the um, archives of the Daily News, of the owner, Joe Patterson, is that uh, there was such a sustained campaign against the Daily News in the Jewish community, and some vandalism, like the delivery drivers would report that, that kids in Jewish neighborhoods would egg their trucks um, and, and you know, scream at them that the Daily News was anti-Semitic. Um, so Joe Patterson actually hired a consultant and said, why are people saying I'm anti-Semitic? Uh, and the consultant looked at the Daily News over the course of a couple of months and wrote a report and said, well, because it is anti-Semitic. And you might want to think about, you know, particularly uh, toning down your editorial page there were a lot of letters to the editor that were overtly anti-Semitic and pro-Nazi, and so maybe you should censor those or not run them so prominently. Maybe you should think about the way that you present your news. And Patterson said, oh, that's not true. He just dismissed the report, uh, paid the guy, and made no changes. But then a few months later, he got a report from his, you know, his business people that said, you know, don't worry about it. The, the campaign isn't hurting our profits. So, um, so he didn't change his ways. Certainly, certainly, though, people were aware of it. And Solzberger? Solzberger? Well, Solzberger, I think, was in this, this bind um, that Leslie talked about, that he didn't want to appear too Jewish. So certainly the New York Times was known as a much more pro-interventionist newspaper than the Daily News or most newspapers. But even then, he was afraid of going too far, having too much Jewish news, too much news about Europe, because then uh, people would say, oh, that's just the Jewish New York Times. Apparently, he also believed that Judaism should be regarded only as a religion, not as a race. And he felt that uh, if they started covering the, uh, the Nazi persecution of Jews as a race, as a whole, that that might give the appearance of, of Jews being other than just people who choose to worship in a certain way. So thank you. I mean, this is all particularly relevant here. And I guess the credo is, right, if you don't study history, you're condemned to repeat it a bit. And as a history professor, I'm just wondering, you know, what, to what degree was it really isolationism or was that a, a word you know, to mask anti-Semitism, just as kind of anti-Zionism is being used as a word, perhaps, to mask anti-Semitism when it comes 
to the Middle East right now? That's a really good question. Um, it's isolationism is somewhat of a fraught term because some historians don't like to use it at all. And they say, oh, no, you should call them anti-interventionist because they, you know, they wanted to invade Latin America all the time. So it's isolationist about that. Um, but by the so same token, I don't think anti-interventionist works. And they liked to call themselves isolationist. Um, they would have editorials in which they said, yes, this is an isolationist paper. We're proud to be an isolationist paper. And I hadn't ever thought about, actually, to what degree they embraced the term, not because they thought it was just straightforward, I want to isolate myself from the continent, but because they didn't want to say, I'm anti-Semitic. Um, it, you're, you're right. It could have been a, you know, a euphemism for them. Two questions, if I might. Oh. Uh, first of all, yeah, that's cool. First of all, um, how did they cover Lindbergh in that era? Um, and and second of all, you you didn't. I, I understand the scope of the book, but you haven't addressed Henry Luce and Time Magazine and what effect that might have had. Yeah. So Henry Luce came late to the fight, but when he did come, he was very pro-interventionist, and he used Time Magazine, uh, especially starting in about 1940, to argue for intervention. So certainly by that time, there are other important voices in the media. Um, Time Magazine alone doesn't approach the circulation of all of these newspapers, but it does definitely become an interventionist uh, outlet by 1940. Um, and as far as, um, I'm sorry, what was your first question? Lindbergh. Lindbergh, yes. Well, that's kind of interesting. Um, McCormick loved Lindbergh. Uh, Lindbergh was from the Midwest. McCormick considered himself the ultimate Midwesterner. And so, uh, at first, he ignored the controversy over the Des Moines speech, and then he tried to, uh, you know, promote Lindbergh. But he, they had a big spread in the Chicago Tribune about all of the medals that he had won. And they had a big picture of all of them. They left out the Nazi medal that he had gotten. Um, so, in, in other words, it was very selective um, coverage of it, telling their their readers only what they thought was positive about Lindbergh. Um, Hearst, interestingly, and I don't quite know where this comes from, but he was upset by the Des Moines speech. This is a speech where Charles Lindbergh, of course, this great American hero, said that, that uh, Jews, the British, and the Roosevelt administration were, were dragging the United States into war. And he gave this at a big America First rally in September of 1941. And, um, so uh, the Hearst newspaper suddenly turned on Lindbergh and said, you know, no, this is, this is way too overt, <laughs> right? We, we are, this is, this is, this is gross anti-Semitism and we won't have anything to do with it. So Hearst distanced himself from Lindbergh. Over here. Uh, I, oh, sorry. I do have a question, um, but let me just say I started out with Hearst in the early 60s, and you mentioned their free spending ways, and somehow they passed me by on that. Um, I did want to ask, especially because when you, he mentioned the Lindbergh situation, I thought of the Mitfords in, in England, and I wondered if how they were treated since they became famous uh, for their association with the Nazis, too. How were the Mitfords uh, treated? <laughs> Right, right. Well, you know, uh, Beaverbrook was never um, was never a, a, a fascist, so he didn't hang out with um, British fascists the way Rothermere did. Um, and Rothermere actually died in 1940. He was afraid he was going to be interned as a as a Nazi sympathizer, and so he arranged with his friends in the British government to be given a. a a mission to Canada to go look at the munitions plants there. So he came to Canada and he ended up um, dying while he was visiting Bermuda. 
So I don't know how he would have interacted with uh, the overtly fascist members of the of the Mitford family. Um, so that's just something I don't know the answer to. Sure. Mary, mm -hmm. Mary. So um, there were other Jewish-owned newspapers other than the Forward, and one of them, of course, was the Washington Post. And it's fascinating, and you can do the arithmetic yourself, that Catherine Graham never knew she was Jewish. Until she went to Vassar, she was born in 1917. She was in Vassar in the early 30s. And her roommate said to her, what do, what do you think about your Jewish blood? So that puts another perspective on this whole issue of Jews in power and uh, denying their faith. Yes, no, that, that, that is, that's interesting. The Washington Post, of course, is now a great newspaper and was a great newspaper in the 1970s during Watergate, and it tends to be the first newspaper we think about when we think about Washington, D.C. But it was not as, it didn't sell as many copies as Sissy Patterson's Washington Times Herald at the time. So I think one of the mistakes that historians can make is they can say, well, today I read the New York Times and the Washington Post, so they must have been the ones that people were reading in the 1930s, when in fact it was, um, you know, the much more uh, rabidly nationalist right wing papers that were appealing to a lot of pe people. Uh, how did. Uh the, how did the Roosevelt administration counter this, the, 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 this torrent? They did get Lend Lease through, and they, did, they didn't pack the court, but they did a number of other things. So, what was the, how, how was that countered? And is there any, are there any signs for today about how it might be countered? That is an excellent question. Obviously, uh, the lesson to be learned, I think, is, that, uh, is to fight back, which is what Roosevelt did. It, in the late 1930s, say like 37 to 39, he was a little bit cowed by the isolationist media. For example, he gave a, a speech in 1937 in Chicago called the Quarantine Speech, and he was just immediately eviscerated by the Chicago Tribune and the, and the Hearst media, and he decided, okay, I'm not gonna be quite as confrontational. Or if I do, if I am confrontational, I'm gonna pay a price. Um, so he, he certainly was aware that this environment was making it difficult for him to say many things, do many things about Europe. By 1939, once the war started though, he decided he was going to go out there and fight. So as I said, the, the, the title, of the newspaper axis comes from Harold Ickes, one of his advisors. Harold Ickes was sort of like the point man to go out and to tell people the newspapers are uh, not giving you the full story here. If you're just reading Hearst and McCormick and Patterson, you're not learning everything. They are actually very sympathetic to the Nazi cause and you should expand your read, reading material. And uh, Roosevelt also went after Lindbergh um, in radio speeches. Roosevelt used the radio when he couldn't get through, the, uh, when he couldn't use the newspapers. So that was, was one of his techniques. He also certainly worked with people in Hollywood. Hollywood uh, tended to be much more interventionist than the print media. And by 1940, 41, there were more and more interventionist movies being made. So he essentially, he gave speeches against the isolationist press and he tried to cultivate Henry Luce. He tried to cultivate Hollywood. He tried to use the radio to get out an alternative message. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the newsreels. You describe in the book how uh, Hitler made a deal that, that Hitler's own newsreels would be played in America on, uh, through some of these outlets. Yes, yeah, so, so Hearst made a deal with Hitler where there was a, a film sharing uh, agreement where it was rumored that Hearst also got a payout of $400,000. Nobody was ever able to prove this. He sued people who said that it happened. Haven't ever found archival evidence, but this is what, what Hearst's opponents believed, that he also received a payout. But certainly he did a business deal with the Nazi uh, film company, newsreel company, where he agreed to show their film in his American newsreels in return for Hearst newsreels being shown in Germany. So it was, 
uh, unfiltered Nazi propaganda that people were seeing in the Hearst uh, newsreels in the mid-1930s. You also discuss uh, the role of the movie Citizen Kane uh, in describing uh, Hearst. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about that and how finally through that movie there was a, a, a kind of overt an attempt to, this is who we're listening to. This is William Randolph Hearst. Yes, um, so, so there are a lot of people who despised Hearst through the 1930s. As I said, there was a boycott campaign in the 36, 37 that, that, was, that did hurt his profits. Um, and then Citizen Kane was everybody interpreted as a movie about Hearst. Um, what I would say is that we also need to consider it as an interventionist movie because uh, when you watch it carefully within within eye to uh, isolationist politics, you realize that Hearst is being criticized in, in the movie, not just for being um, uh, a sensationalist, but also for being an isolationist. Over here, if you found that, for instance, your book would be, um, in this moment on campuses, less popular? That history, the history lessons from your, your research, um, uh, less popular than they might have been in the past? Or how is it being, how is it being uh, received in that, in that context? Well, I would say that um, at research universities, there has been a decline in history majors, but it's not precipitous. So for example, at UC Davis, we used to have 400 history majors, now we have 330 or so. You know, it's, it's not what we'd like, but it's not a catastrophe. Um, and certainly, I would say that in research universities and upper level classes, they still assign books like my book. You know, there's still a lot of, um, uh, historical monographs written by scholars. Uh, there is concern that the students are just reading less these days, so that in some, uh, some colleges they just have a textbook, and so they only learn, you know, uh, they, they don't learn anything that really engages their interest, I don't think, and so that makes them not so interested in majoring in history. But I would say that in general, I'm, I'm not quite as, uh, despondent about the future of the humanities and social sciences as some people are. Over here. I thought you used public opinion research in this book really well. Um, first, so my first question is, what resource did you use to access all that polling? I saw in the footnotes that you used public opinion quarterly a few times, but did you use like Roper Center or anything? And my second question is, what do you um, think caused the shift in public opinion over time? Because that's something you track with it. But if these papers continued their isolationist writing, what, what resulted in the shift, specifically in America? Um, yes. Uh, first of all, as far as the, as the sources, Yes, sometimes I cited the print sources because we have them on the shelves at UC Davis and I'm just, I still love print and I like going through them and looking at them. But yes, I also use the, the, the Roper database. Um, and as far as, um, uh, I'm sorry, what was your question again? Okay. Oh yes, okay. So the reason that it shifted, I think, is because people began relying uh, less on newspapers for their sources. By, it's kind of late, you know, the war has already started in Europe, so we're talking 1940. But by that point, as, I, as somebody brought up Henry Luce, by that point, uh, Time Magazine um, is definitely uh, interventionist. By that point, people are getting a lot more of their root news from the radio. And the radio uh, is riveting by 1940. I mean, it's Edward R. Murrow on the, on the roof of the BBC uh, reporting about the bombs falling on London. And this is making people like feel the war in a way that they weren't when they were just reading the newspaper. 
Um, and then also, as I mentioned, the, 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 the movies suddenly start getting much more um, overtly pro-ally. This is in part because they were selling, they were um, selling movies to Germany up until the late 1930s. And when that, uh, so they don't want to offend the Germans. And then when that market is cut off, then they, uh, you know, are much more free to make more interventionist movies. So I think that there are other media sources out there and that once the war is actually going on, that people pay more attention to it before, uh, 1939, they might look at a few headlines, editorials, and say, oh yeah, we don't want anything to do with that. After the war starts, they start uh, paying more attention. So there's a, and then also the Roosevelt administration gets much more aggressive in its public messaging. So all of those things come together to make it possible by you know February of 1941 for uh, Len Lease to uh, get a majority in the House of Representatives and then in the Senate. Hello, uh, thank you. Uh, first, a comment. Um, it seems to me that uh, this gentleman mentioned Lindbergh. Uh, Philip Roth wrote a book, uh, The Plot Against America, in which Lindbergh was elected president rather than Roosevelt, which is kind of interesting. And I, I assume George Orwell, with his newspeak, and, uh, uh, was a reaction against some of this uh, press. But uh, the question is, um, are journalists today trained to be more objective and not to um, have an opinion about what they report? And um, I must say, sometimes I get frustrated that a lot of the news is very bland. I mean, it's like they're painting a picture, but you know, uh, there, there's no, there's no. Uh, Frequently, there's not a point of view, or there's, the, and maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. Well, uh, also, I can defer to Leslie on this. Um, I, it, starting in the 1920s, they started to have codes of ethics for journalism that said, you know, don't just report the facts, don't take an opinion, be sure not to have any bias uh, to the extent that that's possible. It just didn't uh, affect the world of uh, particularly Robert McCormick and William Randolph first. You know, they didn't care that these organizations are passing these codes of ethics. And so they would, they would write memos every day, you know, dozens of memos to their staff saying, I couldn't believe this story about the New Deal, my, Roosevelt's administration propaganda, make sure that doesn't show up again. So that people, the reporters knew what was expected of them. Um, I, I think that that's still an ideal among uh, journalists today, uh, though there also is pushback, uh, the ideal being um, that you don't have any bias in your stories. There is pushback, though, starting in, say, the era of the Vietnam War with reporters who said, what does that mean, no bias? Does it mean you're just a stenographer to power? Um, you know, you gotta have your own opinions. You gotta look for other sources. There's bias in everything we do. So it's, you know, it's, it's a contested issue. But uh, Leslie knows more than I do about this. Well, this is a subject that my husband, uh, Dan uh, Werner, and I talk about a lot because I was at the New York Times and he spent his whole career at uh, the News Hour on, uh, on PBS. Where in, in both cases, I think we both grew up and lived our lives thinking that the news media should be unbiased, it should report objectively what the facts are. When I first came to Washington, I, it was just imbued in me that you get the Republican point of view, you get the Democrat point of view, you get the public interest point of view, and you lay out all the different points of view and you leave it to the reader pretty much to decide where the truth lies. But I think that the Trump era uh, and uh, the, the Fox News uh, ethos have really changed the scene because when you have uh, reporters who are just trying to report the facts and the truth, and you have people in front of you who are spouting lies as if they are the truth, then the mission of the journalist has to change. And I think that remains today a, a great question, uh, an open question, and as we move toward the next election, I think the news organizations are going to be increasingly grappling with that. 
Do you tell the president to his face that, that is a lie, that is not true? How, you know, how on your toes does that make, for example, the people have to be who are moderating debates to be able to pick everything out in real time? But uh, certainly, I think the situation has changed. What was once the ideal may no longer be the ideal if you're going to just be a neutral stage in which people can spout their own version, version of reality and call the other version f fake news. There was another newspaper in New York in the late 30s. It was owned by a Jewish woman by the name of Dorothy Schiff. What was she doing as she saw the tabloid uh, Daily News uh, purchased by the thousands on the streets of New York? Well, it, the interesting thing about the journalism market in this era is that you did have a choice um, in many cities, you might have five newspapers to choose from. Uh, and certainly, the publishers that were not the tabloids, were not the Hearst newspapers, uh, were discouraged by the fact that the other newspapers were selling much better. But they believed that, you know, they believed in quality. They believed that they had a better quality project, a product, and they were happy to you know, they were still making profits on their quality products, so they didn't try and imitate uh, the other newspapers. I mean, the thing is, it sort of depended on which city you lived in, to what extent you had a choice. You certainly had a good choice, amount of choices in Washington, D.C. and in New York. In Chicago, they had five newspapers, but, you know, they were all, uh, four of the five were right wing. So, uh, f you know, you really had to, be devoted to that one liberal newspaper, with one Democratic Party newspaper, if you wanted to get that point of view. So, but there, there, there definitely were, this is the era before consolidation, so there were more choices. And you do mention in the book that Schiff and the Post uh, in New York were more um, supportive of Roosevelt. Yeah. yeah. We have time for one or two more. Getting a nice, nice little workout in. Um, I had a question. What newspapers were the decision makers reading? And when you show the circulation, it may have been, you know, tens of millions of Americans, but not the people in the State Department um, who were making the decisions. And also, my second question was, did you look at side by side the New York Times against some of these other newspapers where the facts reported differently, or was it just the opinion seeping into the facts? these um, tabloid type newspapers. Um, I don't know if you, if, if you looked at specific events and compared how the New York Times covered it compared to some of these newspapers. Yes, it was a matter of emphasis. You know, as, as Leslie said, you can run um, a, a story but put it on page 61 and it doesn't have nearly the impact. So it was a matter of emphasis. It was a matter of, um, of, of, of placement and length, but also of the words that were used to describe them. So, for example, uh, you know, I look closely at the land lease coverage in all of these, and it was very different to see the same debates in Congress covered in these different newspapers, but the quotations that they chose were very different. And then also the word they used for the bill was very different. Um, the Roosevelt administration took advantage of, a, of an opportunity or a supporter of the Roosevelt administration with Lynn Lease to number it. It was HR 1776. And so that's how the Roosevelt administration initially described Lynn Lease was Bill 1776. Um, and so you would see that in some pro Roosevelt newspapers, and in others they would say, you know, Roosevelt's a dictator bill. It's making its way through Congress. Um, so, uh, so it, it, yeah, emphasis, words, you know, it, 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 there was a dramatic difference in what sort of opinion you would have about an event based on which newspaper you read. Similarly, I suppose today, depending on, you know, which um, TV news story you happen to observe. Right? 
when you talk about words in the book, you just describe how uh, Americans were much more willing to go to war against the Japanese, and the newspapers were sort of riling that up by using words like wily savages and yellow peril. Uh, that set the stage for the kind of internment, of course, of Japanese Americans that occurred on the West Coast, but just a general feeling that well, it might be okay for us to intervene in uh, in the Pacific theater, but not in, not in Europe, because that's a white race, and we don't want to be damaging the white race. No, that's a very good point. The Daily News, in particular, was very afraid of um, of the white race fighting itself, but was much. Um, uh, more willing to go to war against Japan, and once it was at war against Japan, it, uh, you know, advocated for, uh, you know, ignoring the Geneva Conventions and having, you know, all-out um, uh, warfare, brutal warfare against the Japanese. Well, I really want to commend this book. It's a really interesting read, and certainly uh, as we do move into another election cycle, it's so important to be uh, astute readers of the press. And I, I must say, if anyone is interested in looking into this, I did find this incredible article that was written by Max Frankel back all the way back in 2001, in which uh, you can find it through Google and the New York Times. And uh, it, it's worth reading because he says, there was failure, none greater than the staggering, staining failure of the New York Times to depict Hitler's methodical extermination of the Jews of Europe as a horror beyond all other horrors in World War II, a Nazi war within the war, crying out for illumination. And then he goes into great detail with specifics about how the Times failed to cover this and, and really just squelched it uh, on purpose. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of shocking, and you can find it. The date, again, was November 14th, 2001. Wow. if you're interested in seeing that. But we're going to have books for sale out here and hope that you will support our great scholar. Thank you. So I just want to quickly um, thank everyone that I should thank, um, which is certainly thank you to Mark Shinison and Jim Goldman for bringing uh, Dr. Olmsted to us today. Um, thank you, Leslie Maitland, for everything that you do here at Washington Hebrew and for bringing so much scholarship to our BIMA, um, and particularly for moderating this discussion today. Um, and Dr. Olmsted, we, we actually are starting a, uh, a new month this week. We're starting the Adar One, the month of Adar this week in, in, Jewish, in the Jewish calendar. Um, and Adar has the, the holiday of Purim in it, in which we do everything upside down, right? The whole world turns upside down on Purim. What's good is evil. What's evil is good. What we thought was the story is not the story, right? It's all it's all sort of um, up in the air. Um, and what and and through that we see that we actually value that. We value looking at a narrative and looking at it from different perspectives and having the, our whole world turned upside down. Um, and so, Dr. Olmsted, what your research has done is it's turned a narrative upside down, right? This narrative um, of <laughs> what newspapers are prominent in our country and who we should be paying attention to, um, as well as this narrative of um, how prominent um, these ideas were uh, in our country way back when. I think um, for, for many of us who are not historians, the narrative we have is like, you know, the United States was, was of course, we were the good guys. We were a little late to the show, but like we were good guys in general, right? Um, and, and what you've shown us is actually that it was much more prominent and, and really turns the narrative upside down, um, which is always helpful to see um, what, what it is that has happened in history What's, what it is when a narrative is turned upside down and how perhaps we're living in a narrative today too and thinking about how we might want to make it right side up um, to make our world a, a better place. So really thank you for your research and for being here. Um, thank you all for being with us.